A reading from the first letter of Peter. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then, if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if this is what God wills, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago, when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God, and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning to you from a very unusual place, my backyard. I'm under COVID protocols. Why? Because I just came back from traveling to Malawi. Next week, I will be preaching to you live from our sanctuary to you back in your homes, in your living rooms. But this week, it's from my backyard. I just want to give a brief update of, of what's going on. Uh, the last couple of weeks, my updates have been surrounding about events like and tasks like getting eyeglasses onto the face of people. But I want to tell you what God is doing around the world in terms of growing his church. The Malawi Mennonite Brethren Church is experiencing incredible growth. And one of the reasons why they're experiencing incredible growth is the passage that I'm preaching on this morning, they take it to heart. They don't just believe it in their minds, they apply it to how they live life. I'll be telling some stories about some of the workers from our church over there right away. But this is also a passage that when I read it when I was 18 years old and understood it for the first time, it changed how I reached out into the community. The passage we're about to study this morning, it's, it's, my, it's my life verse or life verses on how to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So, the passage that we just heard read just a few minutes ago talks about suffering. I have an opening illustration from the world of medicine. I, I love stories of science and medicine. I want to tell you about how a doctor named Paul Brand discovered how important pain and suffering can be. We all have heard of leprosy. Leprosy is the dreaded disease in the Bible where people are shunned because they didn't understand how was leprosy spread. Well, back in the late 1940s, they found out that leprosy was contracted by a fungal infection. There was great excitement about this. Maybe we could finally end the scourge of leprosy by treating the fungal infection. And while they were able to stop others from getting, they were not able to stop it from spreading for those who had it. You see, the understanding or, or thought, and this is a logical thought, was that fungal infection was the thing that caused people's fingers, eyebrows, uh, toes, and eventually other limbs to rot and fall off in a horrible, terrible looking death. But Dr. Paul Brand made the discovery to understand what is the real problem. You see, when he was a child, he grew up in India, and he dreamed about coming back as a doctor. And now he had come back, 
and he was working in a leper colony. And he, during his first year, he, he quickly became friends with a young boy who had just been dropped off of the leper colony because he was in the first stages of leprosy. He went to the back into one of the storage lockers to try to unlock it and get some of the supplies, but he was unable to open the padlock that was on the supply locker. And this boy who had been following said, hey, let me try. He took the key, put it in the padlock, and he popped it right open. Dr. Brand was totally surprised. How did this boy who, who was below average for his size, at 10 years old, able to do something that he couldn't do? And that's when he saw blood dripping on the ground. And that was the aha moment. He looked at the boy's thumb and he had cut it right down to the bone. Now I want you at home to do something. Any, all of you, simply take your two fingers together and press them together as hard as you can. And eventually you will all stop. This is what Dr. Brand discovered. That when you have leprosy, the nerves have been damaged by the fungal infection. It's not the fungal infection that causes the debilitating rot that happens in people's hands and feet and eyebrows and hair. It's that they don't feel pain. That boy could turn that lock beyond his threshold of pain, not because he's stronger than average, but because he doesn't feel the pain of turning the lock. Do you see what's going on here? Pain protects you. Do you know that your muscles in your hands are more than strong enough to rip your hands apart? What stops you from doing so? Pain. Pain is your friend that protects you. Even a simple itch, and you start scratching it, what stops you from scratching? Pain does. Let me read to you what Paul had to say about pain in his book, as he describes this. Pain is not unpleasantness to be avoided at all costs. In, a, in 1,000 ways, large and small, pain serves us each day. Without pain, we would lead lives of paranoia, defenseless against unfelt dangers. The only safe place for a painless person is in a bed. But even that is not safe because even that produces bed sores. Suffering and pain are often thought in the West as something to be avoided at all costs by Christians. But pain is not always a bad thing. In fact, suffering and people seeing how you deal with suffering might be your best witness for an unbelieving world and how and why they should follow Jesus. So let's dig into this passage. I'm going to go through them slowly verse by verse. Starting off with 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 13. Now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? Those are just good words right off the bat. If you're striving to do good, the likelihood of you experiencing persecution goes down dramatically. But, but even if you suffer for doing good and what is right, God will reward you. So don't be afraid of their threats. Well, let me tell you about my friend Safari. Safari is the executive director of the Mennonite Brethren Church in Malawi. He grew up in a wonderful home. In a village of about 2,000 people, his father was the lead pastor of the Mennonite Brethren Church in Congo, near the Burundi border. One day, a militia came into their village and massacred everyone. Everyone was killed in the village. Safari escaped with his life only by pure luck. He happened to be hit on the back of the head with the blunt end of the machete. He still has the scar where that hit him, but instead of cutting through and killing him, it knocked him out cold and it left him for dead. He awoke in the middle of the night. Everybody around him was dead, and he fled. At first he fled to Burundi, and war followed him there. 
and then Rwanda, and the war followed him there. He eventually went to Uganda, and he found nowhere where he belonged. And eventually he walked over 1,400 kilometers to Malawi, to Zalika refugee camp. After he arrived there, he found three other sons of pastors, all about the same age as him. And they started a Bible study group. And they elected him as the leader. They said, your dad was the best preacher of all of our dads. You're the leader of our group. And Safari actually didn't want to be. I met all these men. They called him out to be the leader. And that church, which started with four people in a little shack, I saw the shack, grew into a church in the next few years of about 250 people. And that is in one Sunday walked the dreaded enemy, Gilbert. I'll talk about him in a few moments. But let me continue to read. 15. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if somebody asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. This is my life verse. People ask me all the time, how do I share my faith, Pastor Greg? This verse tells us exactly how to share our faith. And if somebody asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. What is your hope in? My hope is not in money. My hope is not even in my family. Don't get me wrong, I love my family dearly, but my hope is in Jesus Christ. But I need to do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keeping your conscience clear. Gilbert. Gilbert was the leader of the militia. And when he came into the refugee camp, Safari heard about it. And he knew exactly who Gilbert was. And he sought him out. And he sought him out to tell him this. I forgive you. He didn't know what to expect. He didn't know what shape the man would be in. But he was in horrible shape when Safari found him. He was half dead. You see, when you come into the refugee camp, there's no place for you to stay at first. The UN doesn't have a hostel to put you up into until you got your feet underneath you. All they do is you come in with a small food ration. That's it. No place to sleep, no place to go. Death is absolutely rampant in the refugee camp. I just talked to the director while I was there a few weeks ago. He said each week over 135 people die. This is a refugee camp now of 52,000 people. That means in each year almost 6,000 people die and very, very few of them die of old age. The vast majority of people who die are children, by the way. Safari sought him out. First to tell him, I forgive you. But then he saw his dire straits, that he wasn't sure this man would survive. So he brought him home to his wife. And he lived with them. Over the next year and a half, Safari helped track down his wife and the few living children that Gilbert had. And brought them to the refugee camp. And he led Gilbert to the Lord. Gilbert is now one of our pastors at one of our Mennonite Brethren churches in the Zalika refugee camp. For me, it doesn't look the same as him. It'll look different for each one of you. What does it mean to tell where our hope is in and how to do it in a gentle and respectful way? In high school, it looked like when I was being mocked for not following with the party crowd. I just gently said, I don't follow that way because God has a better way for me. A few years ago, about four years ago almost now, when we at Global Vision 2020 had been nominated for an award called the Creator Awards, I got to fly out to New York City to sit in Madison Square Gardens and share what we were doing with Mennonite Brethren Mission at that time in Myanmar. And 
one of the best parts of the whole event was me sitting down with other brilliant scientists, inventors, whether they were from the University of Berlin or, or Michigan or Pennsylvania or even a few NASA scientists. And they asked me, why do you believe what you believe? And the thing that I told them, my hope is in the person of who Jesus Christ is. And I did it in a gentle manner, not in a mocking way, not in a way to belittle, but I simply presented my faith and why I put my faith in Jesus Christ. That is how I share my faith in every aspect of my life. For Safari, he was with his dreaded enemy. And God did incredible things. Let me go on and read further. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. So what is our hope in? Who is our hope in? Who Jesus is. See, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, shortly after the Last Supper, Jesus said, you will experience all kinds of suffering and I will be with you. Follow my example. Jesus understands what we go through. I want to tell you a hard truth. In this world, you will suffer. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But here's the options. When you suffer, will you try to get through it on your own strength? Or will you try to get through it with Jesus walking alongside you? Being your example. For me, the choice is obvious. The choice was obvious for Peter. Look at how Peter was transformed. Let's not forget from the first sermon in this series what was going on exactly at this time in history. Persecution was just starting to break out in a major way in the Roman Empire. In less than three years after this letter was written, Peter himself would be crucified. This was the same man who couldn't even acknowledge Jesus before Jesus was crucified, who now was willing to follow him at any cost, and he was transformed with humility. Peter then goes on to talk about stories from the Old Testament, specifically Noah's flood, and how Jesus ministered. Because remember, Jesus, who is God the Creator, was the one that sent the flood and how he ministered to people who weren't listening then. He goes on to give the picture of the flood being baptism that washed away sin. But our baptism saves us not from removing dirt from our body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything in our faith hinges on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. So, now what? What do we do with this? Well, as I said before, we will all suffer. Suffering will come in this life. One of the greatest heresies in our culture today, in the Christian culture, is a belief that's called the health and wealth. That if you suffer, there's something wrong with you and you're not right with God. In the secular society, if there's any sort of suffering, you must do everything in your power to stop it. But in this life, before the second coming of Jesus, we will suffer. It's how we deal with that suffering that changes everything. For me, my choice is to follow Jesus. And he's walked me through hard times, and he can walk you through them as well. 
there are many people that are struggling right now greatly. What are some of the struggles? Well, <laughs> COVID. Look, I'm outside doing my sermon in my backyard from a video camera. How many people have lost their jobs and their livelihoods? Marriages are struggling. You're suffering. Jesus is with you. He will not leave you. He understands your suffering. It's not his plan to make you suffer. That's the result of sin in the world. But what does he promise? That he will walk us through. So your choice is, are you going to try to walk through on your own strength? Or are you going to try to walk through on God's strength? Here's my challenge to you. Say, Jesus, you understood suffering much greater than me. Help me to be a witness in all that I do. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.